Hi everyone. So we are moving on to our scrotum module, also known as our male reproductive system. Within this PowerPoint, we are going to be talking about all of the normal male reproductive anatomy. So this mainly is going to include the scrotum and the scrotal contents, but we're also going to talk about the prostate and how all of these organs are so closely related uh, and how they all kind of work together. So this means we are going to be covering the prostate, the testicles, the epididymis, and a lot of these accessory structures. A lot of these structures are what we call modes of transportation. So it's taking something from one area and transporting it uh, through another. So we are going to be following a lot of different pathways when we're talking about the anatomy and the function of these structures. They all piece together. So please make sure you have a good understanding of one structure before we move into the next structure. So here we just have an overall diagram of some of the structures and organs that we're going to be talking about. Mainly going to be talking about the scrotum and the contents. The contents of the scrotum are going to be the testicles and the epididymis. And then of course, all other uh, components of those organs. We also are going to be talking about the prostate, the seminal vesicle, the uh, ejaculatory duct, um, a little bit of like bladder and uh, location as well. So all of this is kind of just a basic overview for what we are going to get into. So let's start with our prostate first. Now prostate, as we know, this is a male specific organ. Its purpose is to secrete alkaline fluid that's going to provide um, kind of a vehicle for transportation for the sperm. So the purpose of sperm obviously is to fertilize a um, female ovum or an egg that's released. So how do we get the sperm from the testicle through the ejaculatory duct to meet that egg? It has to travel in this alkaline fluid. The, the sperm or the spermatozoa, they are very small microscopic uh, structures and they need a vehicle to travel through. So that vehicle is coming from the prostate. The prostate's main function is to secrete that alkaline fluid so the spermatozoa can travel in it to meet that egg. So it's gonna produce the majority of that ejaculatory fluid volume the prostatic glandular tissue, so the functional tissue of the prostate, is also going to produce what we call PSA, and that is prostate-specific antigen. Now, when we get into a lot of prostate pathologies and abnormalities, we're going to talk about PSA quite a bit. And as the male patient ages, we're going to pay very close attention to that PSA level. We can actually uh, test that through blood work um, and other laboratory values. Values. So it's going to be the most accurate method to calculate the function of the prostate by testing that PSA level. Um, and we don't really need to know this, but the, the upper limit of normal for the PSA value and overall function um, is going to be 4 NG per milliliter. So a very small amount of PSA should be being secreted, especially in a young, healthy male patient. When we see high levels of PSA, that's when we're going to be getting into a lot of those pathologies with the prostate. We also know that our prostate is going to uh, be very sensitive to testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. We don't need to get into those hormones too much. Obviously, we've all heard of testosterone before, uh, but the, the prostate is going to be very sensitive to those hormones. So if we have abnormal levels of testosterone, we could have an abnormally large prostate or an abnormally small prostate, or that could really start to affect the overall function of that prostate. So the male hormones, obviously not as complex and not as in-depth as female hormones uh, when it comes to reproductive health, but we do need to know that overall testosterone levels are going to affect that prostate growth and function. So let's talk about the prostate anatomy a little bit. So it actually forms really early on uh, when we are fetuses. So during embryology, it's going to actually um, be derived from what we call the Wolfian duct. And the Wolfian duct is a very, very primitive, almost kind of cellular structure that we see in very early embryos of pregnancy. So when we get into breast anatomy and we get into female reproductive anatomy, the Wolfian duct is like this very primitive structure 
that a lot of our reproductive organs develop from. So this is going to form our prostate by about week 10 of gestation. So very, very, very early on. The prostate, once it's fully formed, uh, now we're talking about an adult patient here, it's going to be comprised of five lobes. We have the anterior, middle, posterior, and then we have two lateral lobes on each side. We also need to be aware of the seminal vesicles. We're gonna come back to these once we get a little bit further further on in the PowerPoint, but these are kind of two outpouchings next to the prostate, next to the bladder that communicate with the vas deferens. We are going to talk about the vas deferens quite a bit, so just bear with me. So the seminal vesicles are going to be located on each side between the bladder and the rectum, and they are going to kind of sit superior and behind the prostate. Now we also have, in addition to those five lobes, we also have what's called zonal anatomy. And when you're doing transrectal ultrasounds on male patients for the prostate, this is kind of what we're looking at. We're dividing the prostate into zones. So we have peripheral, central, and transitional zones. Now the peripheral zone, this is going to be the majority of that functional prostate tissue, about 70% of it. And it's actually going to be located posterior along the outer aspect of that gland. This is where most prostate cancers are going to originate from, which makes sense because it's going to contain the most amount of that functional tissue. Now our central zone, this is going to contain about 25% of the rest of the glandular tissue or the functional tissue. And this is going to be located slightly superior to the peripheral zone. This central zone, it is going to kind of sit in the middle of that prostate. So a lot of these pathways and a lot of these modes of transportation are going to travel through this central middle zone. So our ejaculatory duct is actually going to pass right through that central zone as it's coming from the seminal vesicles to exit out through the urethra. We also have our transitional zone. This is a very small zone. It accounts for about 5% of the functional tissue. And this is commonly going to be a site where we see what is called benign prostatic hyperplasia, also known as BPH. Now, as we get older, as we said previously with those PSA levels, BPH is very common in older male patients. It just means that their prostate is becoming enlarged as they age. So as this very small portion of prostate tissue, right, the transitional zone is only 5%, as this portion gets bigger and bigger and bigger with hyperplasia, right, hyperplasia means it's growing larger, this transitional zone is then going to occupy more and more and more and more space because it continues to grow and proliferate. So we'll talk about that a little bit when we get into our pathologies as well. So talking about our relational anatomy. So as we saw on our very first slide, there are a ton of structures in the male reproductive system that all kind of cross each other, sit next to each other, communicate with each other in some sort of way. And the prostate is going to kind of be located at the epicenter of all of that. So the prostate is going to sit inferior to the seminal vesicles in the bladder. As we said, our seminal vesicles are going to communicate with our vas deferens. They sit on the superior posterior aspect of the prostate. The prostate is going to be located in front of the rectum, but behind the pubic bone. So our pubic bone, as we know, that's that bone that we're scanning when we're looking at the bladder very low in our pelvis. So for a male patient, directly behind that pubic bone and lower to our bladder is going to be our male prostate. Behind the prostate, even further, is going to be the rectum. Now our seminal vesicles, as we said, superior to the prostate and inferior to the bladder because remember our prostate sits below our bladder. So here we have uh, two pretty good diagrams of this relational anatomy of the prostate. So if we look at the picture on the bottom, we can kind of see a little bit of where the bladder would be sitting right here. And we see that the prostate is sitting directly beneath it but it's not really sitting in front of it or behind it. It's kind of just sitting directly below it. Now, if we look at the picture on top, we can see how those different zones are broken up. Now we said our peripheral zone, this is slightly posterior along the outer aspect of the prostate. So we can see that that's occupying the majority of prostate tissue. Our central zone is where all of those pathways are gonna travel right through. 
Oh, sorry. That was our transitional zone. Sorry. Our central zone is where everything is going to kind of pass through here. And then our transitional zone making up the smaller portion. Now the central zone is still located kind of in the middle of the prostate, although this diagram shows how the transitional zone is like smack dab in the middle. It's just much, much smaller. So the central zone is gonna be a little bit more important for us in terms of um, imaging when we're using zonal anatomy. Okay, so here, when we are looking at our prostate on ultrasound, we are taking images of every male patient's prostate when we are doing a bladder exam. That's just standard protocol. So we're imaging the prostate transabdominally pretty frequently. We're not necessarily doing transrectal ultrasounds very often, but we are gonna talk about them in a second. So when we're looking transabdominally, we wanna see an oval retroperitoneal structure. It's going to appear slightly heterogeneous. We don't really worry about that too much. It's not like this perfectly smooth and perfectly round organ. Um, it has a little bit of detail and, and structure and uh, coarseness to it. So it's going to appear slightly heterogeneous with medium level echogenicity. As we know, we're going to see it directly inferior to our bladder. So if we look at our pictures on the side, these are all transabdominal images of the prostate. We have bladder here. We have prostate directly inferior. And then our images on the bottom, much better detail. We have a much higher contrast differentiation between these images. So we have our bladder sitting on top. This is our transverse picture. This is our sag picture. We have our transverse prostate sitting here. And we have our sag prostate sitting here. So you can see they're not perfectly smooth, perfectly round structures, and that's okay. We don't worry about that with the prostate. Now there's something that I do wanna point out on both of these bottom images. When we're looking at the prostate, particularly transabdominally, we can very easily get confused with the seminal vesicle. So this structure right here is not part of our prostate measurement. Now, when we look at that region in sagittal, right, it looks like this. That is not part of our prostate measurement. That is the seminal vesicle. That is not a direct piece of functional prostate tissue. So let me erase those for you so you can get a closer look at them again. So we don't want to include that on our uh, prostate measurement images. And we want to be aware of what that is too when we're looking at the prostate. We don't want to think like, oh, oh my gosh, is that a mass right there next to the prostate? Is that a tumor right there next to the prostate? We want to know and be aware that that is the seminal vesicle. We also don't really evaluate the seminal vesicle either, so I don't want you guys to worry about that. We just need to know that if we see it, that's what it is going to look like. So prostate examination, we've kind of talked about this a little bit already. It's going to be most accurately visualized transrectally. So if we are trying to rule out something specific or something concerning going on with the prostate, we are going to do a transrectal ultrasound. If the patient is just coming in for a routine bladder exam or they're having bladder complications, we're probably going to start with a transabdominal of the prostate to begin with, see what that looks like, see what that measurement is coming in at, and then we could further evaluate with the transrectal if necessary. So it's not going to be the first step that we take in terms of evaluating the prostate. We're going to be doing a transabdominal image. We're going to be getting some blood work and some lab values done. And then from there, we can determine if that patient truly does need a transrectal ultrasound. Of course, anytime we are questioning any type of prostate cancer, we are obviously going to be doing a transrectal uh, ultrasound. So it is going to be the most accurate way for us to get uh, definitive answers. The thing with transabdominal is that it's not going to give us 
the necessary detail specifically of each zone of the prostate that we need. So really all a transabdominal evaluation of the prostate is going to be good for is going to be providing us a volume. So when we take those measurements transabdominally, we're calculating a volume with that, kind of similar to how we do it with the bladder. And then from there, the physician and the radiologist are going to determine where that patient falls clinically. Um, so transabdominal, kind of a good starting point, giving us volumes, things like that. Transrectal, giving us the better detail and breaking up that zonal anatomy uh, a little bit further. So commonly we are going to be using our bladder as a window. So we cannot evaluate the prostate transabdominally if the patient has an empty bladder. So just like when we do a um, pelvic on a female patient, we need their bladder nice and full to use that anechoic fluid structure to make that organ pop, right? To be an acoustic window for us. So we have our patient prep, and then we are doing our measurements. So in transverse, we're doing our width, and in sagittal, we are doing our length and our height. Okay, transrectal ultrasound. So this is something that as a student, you may or may not see. If you have the opportunity to be involved in these exams, you absolutely should be. Uh, protocol varies greatly uh, between clinic sites for something like this. These are typically only going to be done in the hospital. They're also used in conjunction with a biopsy. So if the patient has had lab values done, blood work done, they've already had a transabdominal done, and we need to get an actual tissue sample, one, we're going to use transrectal imaging for guidance of that biopsy, and two, we're already doing this invasive procedure with the patient. We might as well not make them do it again, right? So, if you were a patient and you knew you had to have this done and they said to you, well, we're going to do it first to look and then we're going to do it again to biopsy. You'd be like, well, wait a minute. Like, why can't we just do it all at once and get it over with? Right? So that's commonly what we're doing for these patients. Usually the radiologist is going to be the one to perform the exam, especially if we are doing it in conjunction with a biopsy. We use a transducer that is very similar to a transvaginal probe. If you don't have a transrectal transducer, you can use a transvaginal probe. It's still going to be the same process. We're using a sterile technique. We're putting a probe cover on that transducer and we are following proper disinfection protocols. So it's very similar uh, technically with the transducer. Now the patient, again, depending on the facility, depending on what else the patient is having done, the patient is typically going to be awake for this procedure. I have been in uh, procedures where the patient is mildly sedated, so you will also have anesthesia in the room with you, um, and it can be rather, rather crowded. If the patient is awake for this, we need to, I mean, we need to make sure we're, we're practicing proper patient care um, all the time, whether the patient is sedated or not. But if the patient is awake, we need to make sure that we are keeping them as modest as possible. This is a very stressful, anxiety-producing exam, especially for male patients. We don't want to make them feel any more uncomfortable than they're already feeling. Um, so we just want to be aware of that, that they're not just a patient on our work list. They're not just a number. They're not just an exam. They are a human being behind this. So we want to make sure that we are keeping them as calm, as comfortable, and as covered and modest as possible. So when we're doing these, the patient is going to be laying on their belly in what we call the Sims position. So they're on their belly slightly onto their left side. Their left leg is going to be straight and their right knee is going to be uh, up towards their chest. So in this diagram, this is actually an opposite Sims position. The patient's uh, left leg is up towards the, the chest and their right leg is straight, but they are going to be in this type of patient positioning for ease of introduction of that transducer through the rectum. So again, this is something that we aren't seeing too often, but if we have the opportunity to, we need to get involved if we are allowed and if we can. So when we are doing these transrectally, look at that image on top. Look at how much more detail that's giving us, right? We're getting rid of that distance between the transducer and the organ, right? Because now we're going internally and we're putting that transducer right up to this organ. So we can see that this is a transverse picture of our prostate transrectally. 
and look at this tissue, right? So much more clear, so much more detail with it. Now, remember, this is where our transducer is, right? That's the top of our transducer. So this is how close we are literally getting to that organ. This is the same reason why we do transvaginal Im imaging as well. So we get that transducer as close to that uterus, as close to those ovaries as possible to get the best detail. Now, if we also look at this and we look closely and we use our sonographer eyes, we can see something slightly abnormal. Look at that. Right, so that's going to be some type of pathology that we would have missed if say we go back to an image like this. We would never be able to tell that. We would never be able to find that transabdominally, but we can transvaginally. So here we have two good representations of what this exam is going to look like and what our image is going to be showing us. So on the left side, we've already said transrectal is going to be the best because we can get the transducer as close to that organ as possible. So when our patient is in their SIMS position, or in this example, um, they're using uh, GYN syrups, it's all going to be radiologist preference, but you can see that we are getting that transducer directly up to the border of that prostate. So we are getting that perfect detail that we need in order to make an accurate diagnosis. We are also, if we're using, if we are using this exam in conjunction with the biopsy, we put an actual attachment onto the transducer. So we're not like putting a transducer in, taking it out, putting a biopsy tool in, taking it out. We're not doing that. We're not torturing the patient. We're putting this attachment on the transducer that are both being inserted at the same time. It's, it's literally an attachment. So it's going on the transducer. And then from there, the physician is going to operate either the transducer or the biopsy gun itself. So when we're doing that trans uh, rectally, you can see how close and how easy it would be to get a tissue sample from this type of procedure. Now, if we look at our picture on the right side, this is our transrectal image of the prostate. Now you're probably thinking, what do all of these different zones look like? And how do I know if I'm looking at the right zone? So here we have our transducer interface, right? The top part of our transducer. Here we have our prostate, transverse prostate. Oop, I kind of overmeasured a little bit there. Now, a peripheral zone, we said it's going to be posterior and to the sides. So let me change my color here. Remember, we're looking in transverse here. Posterior and to the sides. This is going to be our peripheral zone. Our central zone is going to be in the middle. And then our transitional zone is going to be right there. And it follows up directly with that diagram to the side. So especially when we're looking in transverse at that prostate, transrectally, peripheral is going to be along the posterior lateral, followed by innermost, the central zone, and then followed by the very small transitional zone. So if I take those away, those outlines, you can kind of see where the tissue changes a little bit, right? So look at between the C and the P, you can see that border, right? Between that central zone and that peripheral zone. Same thing between the transitional zone and the central zone right here, right? So we can kind of see those differences if we're looking hard enough for them. And again, here we have two really good uh, transrectal images of the prostate. If we outline the image on the left side, peripheral zone, C, 
central zone. Transitional zone. Same thing over here, transitional zone. Central zone. And peripheral zone. And obviously we know that this is going to be our bladder. Okay, so we've kind of talked about this a little bit already, but what are some reasons why we would do a prostate ultrasound, whether it be transabdominal or transvaginal? Well, anytime we have abnormal lab values, of course we are going to do imaging. So any abnormal PSA levels, uh, any type of urinary symptoms. So if the patient is going to the bathroom way too frequently, if they are uh, chronically going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, three, four, five times a night, if they're having trouble going to the bathroom, if they also have decreased force of their urine stream, that is going to indicate that they could potentially have an enlarged prostate. Uh, also, anytime we're questioning BPH, that enlarged benign prostate um, as well. Now, if we think about why we would have these urinary symptoms, we know how closely the prostate sits to the bladder. So if our prostate is abnormally large, whether it be BPH or a tumor, it's going to compress upon that bladder and therefore not allow the bladder to empty properly. So the patient's going to feel like they have to go to the bathroom all the time because they're not emptying properly because the prostate is too big, it's compressing on that bladder. Um, so all of those urinary symptoms are going to be associated with that enlargement of this nearby organ. Also any abnormal physical examination, male patients um, get prostate examinations as part of their routine physicals. So if the physician feels something abnormal, of course, they're going to follow up with imaging and blood work. If the patient is having any pain, a lot of times they can confuse it with rectal pain or bowel issues. Um, but really the prostate could be the cause of it as well. Uh, hematospermia, so any type of blood in the sperm or the ejaculatory fluid. Um, also, if the patient's going for infertility treatments and they see hematospermia in the actual sperm sample, that's going to be another type of that as well. And then oligospermia, so if the patient is not producing enough spermatozoa in their ejaculatory fluid, we want to evaluate that prostate. Moving on to the scrotum and the scrotal contents. So when we're talking about the scrotal contents, what does that mean? What structures are we talking about? So we're talking about the scrotum, the testicles, the epididymis or the epididymi, the vas deferens and the seminal vesicles. So we've already kind of talked about the seminal vesicles a little bit and they're not necessarily sitting within the scrotum, but they are so closely related to all of these other structures and they're kind of the bridge between the scrotum and the prostate. So we kind of combine them into both. Just remember they're not actually sitting within the scrotum. So the scrotum itself, the main function of that is to contain, protect, and provide heat regulation for the testicles. The testicles' main job are to produce the actual sperm and the spermatozoa. The epididymis are going to store the sperm and then also kind of work with the transportation of that sperm. The vas deferens are going to transport that sperm from the epididymis up out of the scrotum into the prostatic urethra, which we're going to kind of piece together. And then the seminal vesicles, as we know, are going to meet with that vas deferens to form the ejaculatory duct. And they also produce fructose rich fluid. So along with the alkaline fluid from the prostate, we also have this fructose fluid that all combines to form the ejaculatory fluid. So let's talk about the scrotum itself. When we're talking about the scrotum, we're really talking about what we call the scrotal sac, and that's really all that it is. Um, so the scrotum is different from the testicles. A lot of times people don't know that those are different things, especially male patients. They, it's kind of actually really funny how they don't know how to refer to their own anatomy. But the scrotum is the sac where the testicles sit with it. So the scrotum is a sac of cutaneous tissue. So it's kind of just like regular old skin tissue. We want to see it thin. So we want to have less than three millimeters of thickness of that skin, that scrotal skin tissue. 
And the scrotum is actually going to be continuous with the abdomen. So we have what's called, if we remember from our abdomen lecture last semester, we have our peritoneum, right? That lines our abdominal and our pelvic cavities. Well, that peritoneum is going to come down into the scrotum. And that's actually what we call the tunica vaginalis. Now, when we're talking about the scrotum, we have tunica vaginalis and tunica albuginia. And we'll get to tunica albuginia in a second. But the tunica vaginalis is that extension of that peritoneum from the pelvis down into the scrotum. It's made up of two layers. We have an inner visceral layer and we have an outer parietal layer. The inner visceral layer is going to cover the testicle and the epididymis, right? Because it's visceral. It's touching those visceral organs. It's the inner layer. And then that outer parietal layer is going to line that outer border of the scrotum, the scrotal chamber, the scrotal sac. Now, when we have what's called hydrocele,s these are these fluid accumulations in the scrotum itself. That's where that fluid is going to accumulate. It's going to sit between those two layers because it's kind of just like an open space. Now, we have the space to provide movement for the testicles, um, but when we have a hydrocele, that's where that fluid is going to go. It's going to occupy that free space. We are going to learn all about hydrocele's in the uh, pathology PowerPoint. So we also have, with that tunica vaginalis, so peritoneum comes down from the pelvis, becomes tunica vaginalis. Tunica vaginalis is two layers. Inner layer is going to be touching and covering the testicle. The outer layer is going to be lining that scrotal sac. Okay. The dardos is going to be a fibrous muscular layer that lies beneath the skin and separates the scrotum into two chambers. Now that division of those two chambers is going to be called the scrotal wraith. So the dardos is the fibrous muscular layer that's coming from the scrotal skin and it's separating the scrotum into two different chambers, but that actual separation is called the scrotal wraith. So the division is a scrotal wraith, which is caused by the dardos. Now this is kind of providing a general structure for the testicles to sit within the scrotal sac. So yes, the testicles have free, they don't really have free range, but they have motion, they can move in there. But typically the right testicle is gonna stay on the right side, the left one is gonna stay on the left one. And that is because of the scrotal wraith made by the dardos. So the scrotal sac as well is going to be suspended from the base of the male pelvis. And the reason why the scrotum is located outside of the male pelvis is because sperm cannot survive in the high temperatures of the male pelvis. So the scrotum sits outside of the pelvis so that it can maintain a lower temperature to keep the spermatozoa alive. Now the scrotum, as we've already said, is going to contain the testicles, the epididymis on both sides, and the proximal or original segment of the vas deferens. And we will talk about that in a second. So here we have an MRI image on the left side showing the layers of the tunica vaginalis. So the tunica vaginalis, as we said, we have inner visceral and outer parietal. Outer parietal is lining directly right underneath that skin of the scrotal sac. And then the visceral is lining directly in contact with the um, testicle and the epididymis. We also said that the space between those two layers is common for fluid accumulations resulting in hydrocele's, and that's actually what we're seeing on this picture. So we have all of this fluid right here. This is a hydrocele that's separating those two layers of the tunica vaginalis. Now, if we look at our picture on the right side, we can kind of see those different layers that are all protecting the testicle, right? We didn't talk about a lot of these. We didn't talk about the cremaster muscle. Um, we didn't talk about the spermatic fascia. We didn't talk about a lot of these things. Um, and we don't need to get too crazy with it. But if we just look closely, we have our uh, tunica vaginalis divided by our uh, visceral and our parietal layer. Our visceral layer is going to be covering our testicle right here. Our parietal layer is going to be right underneath the skin. Um, and then we also can kind of see the relationship of the epididymis working with the testicle here. So now we're going to get more into that testicular anatomy, and some of this will hopefully make a little bit more sense. 
So the testicles are paired oval shaped male reproductive organs as we know, we have two commonly. They are going to be surrounded by a fibrous capsule. So now this is not the visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis. This is what we call the tunica albuginia. Now the tunica albuginia is directly in contact, is literally attached, it's fibrous, they're holding on to each other, attached to that testicle. The, the, excuse me, the visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis is going over the tunica albuginia. Okay, so try not to get confused with the two of those. Now the tunica albuginia, yes, it's a fibrous capsule of the testicle, but it's going to kind of work its way inward and provide this internal structure for the testicle. So the tunica albuginia is actually going to kind of work its way inward and these little septations from that fibrous band are going to form what's called the mediastinum testes. Now the mediastinum testes is something that we see on ultrasound and it provides this kind of internal structure separating the testicles into what we call our lobules, okay? The mediastinum testes is going to extend longitudinally along the testicle, so we're going to see it going horizontally along that testicle. And then as those septations, so if we think about the mediastinum testes, that's kind of like hallway, like a hallway in a high school, okay? And then we have these little lobules coming off of that even further. Those are like the classrooms coming off of that major hallway in the high school. Within those classrooms or these wedged shaped compartments are going to be what we call seminiferous tubules, okay? Those seminiferous tubules are then going to converge to form what is called the tubuli recti. So imagine like it's the last day of school, it's your last class, and the bell's about to ring and all of the students start to kind of merge out of the, the doorway, right? You're all kind of like pig piling into a doorway. The students are the seminiferous tubules and they're all converging, right? They're all merging at one region to form the tubuli recti at the doorway. I don't know if that reference really made sense, but we're going with it. Now the tubuli recti are going to enter that main hallway, right? The mediastinum testes, and they're going to form a network of channels called the ret testes. So imagine like everyone's merging out of that classroom hallway, right? Tubuli recti, the tubuli recti are emptying into that main hallway of the high school. And then everyone is kind of dispersing into their own little groups, their own network of channels. And now every one of those students in the hallway are called the ret testes. Testes. The ret testes, as we said, are a network of anastomosing tubules, and at the hilum of the testicle, they're going to carry the sperm to the efferent ductules, and the efferent ductules are going to carry that fluid from the ret testes to the epididymis. Okay, so bear with me, and we will get to that in two slides. This picture on the right slot on the right side is showing that mediastinum testes. So this is what we see on ultrasound, especially if we're looking in sagittal. We see it going longitudinally across that testicular tissue. Okay, moving into our epididymis. So we kind of just talked about how the sperm travels through the testicle and then how it enters into what we call these efferent tubules and then what happens? Then where does everything go once it's coming out of the testicle? Well, it's then going to be going into our epididymis and our epididymis is a six to seven centimeter bilateral, meaning we have one on each side, one for each testicle um, that are going to be sitting superior to each testicle and then travel down along the back side of each testicle. We divide it into the head, body, and tail, kind of like a pancreas a little bit. The head is going to be the largest part, six to 15 millimeters in width. They're going to be sitting at the superior aspect of each testicle, as we said, and they're going to contain those 10 to 15 efferent ductules from the ret testes, which are going to converge or merge together in that epididymal tissue to form a single duct in the body and tail of that epididymis. That single duct is called the ductus epididymis, and it's going to turn into our vas deferens. Our vas deferens is going to travel 
up into the pelvis of the patient by the spermatic cord. And the spermatic cord extends from the scrotum all the way up into the inguinal canal, and it helps to provide suspension for the testes in the scrotum. So the spermatic cord is kind of like a little bungee cord that holds the testicles in place in the scrotum, but also provides a pathway for everything to travel up into the male pelvis. From that, the, sperma the uh, vas deferens is traveling through the spermatic cord, up into the patient's pelvis, traveling around that bladder, and it's going to connect with the seminal vesicles near the prostate. We're going to go a step further, but just bear with me for a second. So few things. I want to go to our next slide, and then we'll go back to the previous slide. So we said we have our tunica vaginalis, which is kind of like the outer lying, uh, layering, lining, layering, line, lining, lying, a little tongue tie there, um, tunica vaginalis, which is going to be the outer lining of the scrotum, where right? it has the two layers, one closer to the testicle and one closer to the skin of the scrotum. And then continuous with the testicle, we have our tunica albuginea, right? It's that fibrous layer that's going to kind of merge itself inward to create our mediastinum testes, right? That main hallway in the high school. Now, as it's doing that, as that tunica albuginea is creating the septation in the testicle, we also have these little wedge compartments that are being formed. So our tunica albuginea is going to be all of this light blue that's kind of merging inward along that testicle, right? It's creating those wedge compartments. It's creating those classrooms. And the classrooms are all going to be exiting into that mediastinum testes. So we have our wedge classroom, right? Our lobules. In those lobules, we have our seminiferous tubules. This is going to be where the sperm first enters into a pathway to exit this testicle. Now, the seminiferous tubules are all going to converge towards that doorway in the classroom to become the um, tubuli recti. Sorry, a little bit of a brain fart there to become the tubuli recti, right? So that doorway, they're all kind of merging to form a single file line to become the tubuli recti. Now, as they enter into that mediastinum testes, they are becoming this network of channels called the ret testes. So what does this look like up until this point? So here we have our lobule, right? Our wedge-shaped classroom. We have our seminiferous tubules, right? And they're converging to become tubuli recti and then they get into that mediastinum testes and they become the ret testes, right? They all kind of find their, their group there. Now the ret testes are going to exit the testicle by 10 to 15 efferent tubules, right? So imagine you have a bunch of different exits out of your high school. Maybe some of you are going to the parking lot. Maybe some of you are going to the bus circle. Maybe some of you are going to the gym. I have no idea. Don't really particularly care, but we're just rolling with the reference. So we have the 10 to 15 efferent du uh, ductules. Those are going to drain right into the epididymis, right into the head of the epididymis here. So you can see they're all still kind of like scraggly and wiggly, right? There's still a bunch of them going on over there. We don't really know how to communicate at the head of the epididymis quite yet. But as we travel along the body and the tail, oh, we start to figure out our pathway a little bit, right? And now we formed one duct, one pathway. This is our ductus epididymis. Okay. Now, as that ductus epididymis exits the tail of the epididymis, right? Here's our tail. It's becoming our vas deferens. Now our vas deferens is going to travel up into the pelvis. So our vas deferens at the tail of the epididymis is going to be traveling up. This example is traveling behind the testicle, traveling up. And then as it's going upward, it's going through the spermatic cord. So let's go back a slide. 
this is our what our spermatic cord is going to look like. So it's going to be that bungee cord between the male pelvis and the scrotum itself. So the vas deferens, right? We here we have our epididymis. Everything is converging. We have our ductus epididymis exiting our tail becoming our vas deferens and the vas deferens is traveling through the spermatic cord to go all the way up into the pelvis of the patient. And then here on the right side, we can see again, those um, lobules convert the, with the seminiferous tubules converging into our tubuli recti, which are then converging into our network of ret testes. The ret testes are converging into 10 to 15 efferent ductules. And then once they've entered into the epididymis, they are merging to form our ductus epididymis as it exits and turns green in this diagram, that is our vas deferens traveling up into the pelvis. So hopefully that kind of pieced some things together for you. Um, now our seminal vesicle. So we have our vas deferens. We traveled up through our spermatic cord. We are now in the male pelvis. What is happening at this point? So we have our seminal vesicles. These are going to be paired glands that sit posterior to the bladder and superior to the prostate. Each vesicle, right, because we're going to have one on each side, is going to join with the respective vas deferens, right? So from the right testicle, that right vas deferens is going up to the right seminal vesicle. Same thing on the left side. Once that vas deferens meets with the seminal vesicle, they are going to merge to form the ejaculatory duct. Now that ejaculatory duct is going to travel through the prostate where the sperm meets with that alkaline fluid and empties into the prostatic urethra. The prostatic urethra is going to become the penile urethra and the sperm is going to be expelled. So let's take a look at this pathway. So we've kind of talked about everything that's already happening in the testicles, right? We have our vas deferens coming up traveling through our spermatic cord into our pelvis. So this is our vas deferens still. We're going around the bladder here, up and around, and then, oh, we get to our seminal vesicle here. Now our seminal vesicle, we're going to pick up that fructose fluid while we're there. So our vas deferens is going to join with our seminal vesicle duct to form our ejaculatory duct here. Okay, we are then going to travel and become the uh, urethra. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Become the urethra and be expelled. And here we kind of just wrote down, if you need a different way to look through this path, um, pathway and you want to see all of it kind of pieced together, you can absolutely uh, go through this. This is pretty self-explanatory, just kind of repeating everything um, that we've already talked about. And same thing with this here. If you need something a little bit more vague to help you remember the pathway, this is a little bit better. Next, we have our vascular supply. So how do we get arterial blood flow and how do we drain venous fluid? So arterial, we have these uh, three main arteries that are going to supply it. And then we also have our right and left testicular arteries. So arterial, we don't need to go too much into this. We just need to know that we have the differential, chromasteric and the testicular artery. Those are going to be our main forms of arterial supply. Now on each side, we're going to have a right and a left. So a right differential, right chromasteric, uh, right testicular, all supplying that one side. So we are going to have this arterial supply bilaterally. Now that testicular artery, they are going to come off of the abdominal aorta below the level of the renal arteries. Now, when we learned about aorta, we didn't learn about testicular arteries coming off as branches, right? Well, they're not major branches. Um, they're not something that we're ever going to see on ultrasound. They're not something that we have to evaluate. 
the aorta has a bunch of these secondary or supplemental arterial branches coming off of it. Like we have an artery coming off of the um, aorta that goes and supplies the diaphragm. We have it that comes and goes and supplies the uh, lumbar vertebrae. So we have all of these other branches that come off of the abdominal aorta. The ones that we have learned about are considered our main branches. They're not the only branches, they're considered the main ones. And then as for our venous uh, drainage, it's going to be drained through a, a, I can never say this word, papiniform, pampiniform, either way, it's drained by a type of venous plexus. Um, so again, it's a very complex network of venous drainage uh, out of the testicle. The right, we also have um, right and left testicular veins. The right testicular vein is going to drain directly into the IVC, and the left testicular vein is going to drain directly into the left renal vein. So very interesting there. We also are going to learn about that when we learn about our ovaries. They follow a very similar venous pathway. Um, so again, our vascular supply and drainage, we don't need to know too much of the details of that. We just need to know what vessels are supplying and what vessels are draining. I'm not particularly sure why I put this picture right here. Oh, to show our vascular, our vascular supply. Guys, bear with me. <laughs> um, so it's, it's very important for us when we are doing a testicular exam to be evaluating blood flow to the testicle. The reason for that is for testicular torsion. We're going to learn all about it, but basically the testicle can twist on its own arterial supply and basically become necrotic um, and undergo tissue death because it's twisting on the artery. It's not getting the arterial supply and the oxygen supply that it needs to continue functioning. So it basically dies off. So when we're doing our, um, our images and our protocol, it's really important for us to be showing actual blood supply, showing accurate blood supply, and doing Doppler evaluations. So we are sampling this testicular vessel, and we're actually getting arterial and venous signals in the same Doppler. If you look very closely at our picture, we have our vein and we have our artery. You can see how close they are together that when we actually do our sample gate, which we're gonna learn all about that in physics, this is our sample gate, right? That little like, it looks like an equal sign. That is actually where we're telling the ultrasound machine we want to sample the Doppler from. So the artery and the vein both fit within that sample gate. So we're picking up both signals. So we have our arterial supply here. Okay, we see that nice pulsatility of that artery. And then we see more of our continuous venous waveform here. So we'll learn all about that in physics. Now our testicular exam or our scrotal exam, we wanna be using a high frequency transducer. So anywhere between 10 to 14 megahertz, our patient is scanned in a supine position. The penile tissue needs to be positioned on the patient's abdomen and covered with a towel. We also ask the patient to place their legs very close together with their scrotum lifted up on top of their thighs so that their legs are providing support for that scrotal tissue while we scan. Uh, a lot of techs will also put a rolled towel between their thighs. Um, I don't particularly do that, but you will see that out at clinical. Every tech does something slightly different in terms of patient prep for the exam. And we also wanna make sure that we are applying a generous amount of, of gel, um, either to the scrotum or to the transducer. You guys are very clean and dainty when you come in for lab and you're putting little dollops of gel on each other. This is not the time for that. You need an insane amount of gel um, because you, you need to make sure you're keeping contact with an organ that's rolling on you. So just a little bit of reality here. What I do as a tech Male patients are extremely nervous to come in for this. Um, and if you know a man, they um, are not the best listeners in the world. And you have to be very explicit with directions, especially if they are nervous. They are not paying attention to anything that you're saying. So you have to be explicit in the directions that you give the patient 
in order to change. And you have to be confident in the way that you explain that. So what I do is I have my patient come in, I talk to them a little bit, I ask them what's going on, I get a little bit of a backstory from them. So they're starting to kind of feel comfortable with me a little bit, and they're not as nervous, and they're listening to me a little bit better. And then I tell the patient that I'm going to step out and allow them to change. I ask them to lower their pants and their underwear to their knees and to not take anything completely off. They are not taking anything off their body. I ask them to lower their pants and underwear to their knees. And then I ask them to cover up with a very large sheet. I do not give them a towel at this point. Those are very simple directions for them to follow. And if you ask the patient to take something off, you are going to walk into a patient that's naked. I cannot tell you how many times that has happened before. You never ask them to take their t-shirt off, but yet they're sitting naked on your table. So make it explicit that you don't need them to take anything off their body. When you come in, the patient should be laying flat on their back. Pants and underwear should be at their knees they should be covered up with a very large sheet. Now, what I do is I ask the patient to flip their penis onto their abdomen. I'm going to put a towel over the sheet where their penile tissue is. And as I hold that towel there, I slowly shimmy the sheet down underneath the towel. So the only thing that is exposed is going to be the scrotum. A lot of times the scrotum isn't even exposed. It just gives me enough room to get my transducer in between the towel and the sheet. And I will, um, I will demonstrate how I do this for you in lab. I'm sure Chelsea will come in and demonstrate what she does for you in lab as well. So it's very important for you to follow explicit directions and make sure you are verbalizing that to your patient. So our ultrasound exam, our testicular component of that, we wanna make sure that the testicles are um, similar in size, similar in echogenicity, especially similar in vascularity as well. When we get into torsion, that's going to be a big, big thing. Adults, the testicles should measure uh, three to five by two to four by three centimeters in dimensions. They should appear nice and homogeneous, nice and smooth, low level echogenicity. We want to see the right testicle isoechoic to the left testicle. We want to make sure we are showing both arterial and venous blood vessels bilaterally, and we're doing Doppler to prove that flow. And then as for our epididymis, so when we're doing a testicular exam, we're not really looking at the vas deferens. We're not looking at the spermatic cord. We're not looking at, you know, the efferent tubules. We're not looking at any of those things. We're looking at the sonographic appearance of the testicle, of the epididymis, and of the surrounding scrotal tissue. So we're not really getting into those details too, too much, but we need to know that in terms of our anatomy and physiology. So the epididymis itself, as we know, there's one on each side. They should appear isoechoic to each other, yet slightly hypoechoic to the testicles. Uh, we also should see appropriate vascularity in both of the epididymi as well. They can appear slightly heterogeneous and coarse because if you think about it, they're composed of all of those pretty large efferent tubules that are all kind of converging and uh, transporting fluid at that region. The head's going to be our largest portion, followed uh, by our body, and then our tail is actually going to be slightly larger than the head and positioned posterior uh, to the lower pole of the testes. That should say slightly larger than the body. Not sure why I have head there, um, but it goes head, body, uh, head, tail, body in terms of size. And it kind of looks similar to a pancreas a little bit. So let's take a look at what something should look like. But first, we are going to do our protocol here. Um, I do have this posted on Blackboard, but we always want to start out with a transverse midline picture, kind of like the thyroid. We want to do a transverse midline showing both testicles. And we're doing that picture with color as well. Um, if we're doing that and we see our left testicle lighting up like a Christmas tree and our right testicle not showing any flow, we need to further investigate. Um, also, if we're seeing 
regular flow on one testicle and then the other testicle is lighting up like super vibrantly, we want to question that for some type of infection or other abnormality, which we'll learn all about in our next PowerPoint. But here we have some nice examples. This is what that transverse midline picture should look like, um, particularly the image on the right side. So we are showing both testicles, this is our right testicle and our left testicle. And if we look really closely, we're getting like this nice color signal here, but then we're not getting anything on this right side. So that's going to you know, make us believe that there's something abnormal happening on that right side. The other thing with this picture on the right that we want to be looking at is our scrotal skin thickness. So if we look right here, this is pretty thick in terms of scrotal skin thickness. That's probably gonna come in at greater than three millimeters. So we wanna question that as something going on as well. Now the picture on the left side. Now, sometimes you have a really old patient and the right testicle is kind of hanging out all the way on one side of the scrotum and the left testicles hanging out all the way on the other side and you can't get the two of them to sit next to each other it's like a disgruntled divorced couple like no matter what you do no matter how you push them together no matter how you scan you can't get them side by side for that transverse midline so you can do a dual screen find the right one update the other side find the left one that's kind of like worst case scenario we want to show them side by side in the same image but if we can't this is an option that we have and here these are nice beautiful sag images of what our testicles should look like nice and smooth nice and round um medium that low level echogenicity we have our mediastinum testes right there on our left side kind of a hyper echoic band traveling longitudinally throughout that testicular tissue um so really nice representations of that now the testicles we kind of talked about it in our thyroid um video that's posted we want to be using for sagittal testes, we want to be using that virtual convex or that wide scan or that wide view application on our screen so that we're not cutting off any of that tissue. And that is what we were doing in that picture on the right side. Now let's look at our epididymis. Epididymis is very hard for you guys to um, scan when you're first starting out. It's hard enough for you guys to turn on a testicle because remember the testicles are moving on you, right? They're kind of rolling around in there. They don't stay put. You have to have really good hand coordination. And then we expect you to find this really small structure that's sitting on top of this like rolling marble in there. So it's, it's hard and it's challenging and they're frustrating. They're a little bit more heterogeneous. So they kind of blend in with the surrounding scrotal tissue. So they, they don't really pop a lot of the time when you're first starting. So here on the right side, we can see how closely that epididymis is sitting on that testicle. Now, this is going to be a transverse view of that epididymal head, right? We see this little triangle here. That means that we are probably looking at the testicle in sagittal. So we have a sagittal testicle and a transverse epididymis head. Because if we remember, right, here's our testicle our epididymis sits like this. So if we're looking at the head, we're catching it on a cross axis if we're looking at the testicle in Sag. So that can be a little bit confusing and deceiving as well. Now, if we look at these pictures on the left side, we see more of our sagittal view of the test, excuse me, of the epididymis, right? And it makes itself obvious because we have a nice epididymal head cyst, another epididymal head cyst here. So that kind of pops out to us a little bit more. Same thing with this picture down here. We have a beautiful elongated epididymis. Now seeing a little bit of free fluid over here is normal. We don't worry about that. We have serous fluid sitting in the scrotum to provide protection for the testicles anyway. But when we see hydroseals, you will know what that looks like. And then we have another transverse epididymal head right here. Some scanning tips so we want to make sure that we are explaining our procedure and prep to the patient. Uh, we want to make sure that the patient gets ready in private. So even if the patient is like, oh no, you can stay, it's fine, it's fine. For your safety and for your comfort, 
just step out of the room. The only time um, I would stay with a patient is if the patient is very elderly um, or handicapped, physically handicapped in some way. You also have the right to get a chaperone. You can get another male tech, another male employee to sit in the exam with you for your safety, for your security. If at any point you are feeling uncomfortable, unsafe, if they are making inappropriate comments, if you don't know what to say or what to do, you have every right to stop the exam and to leave that room and to ask for help. I have had a uh, very difficult patient before who made very inappropriate comments, tried to touch my leg because as we know, we sit very close to our patient. I went and told my radiologist and he kicked that patient out of the practice. So depending on who you're working with, working for, there should be a zero tolerance policy for harassment, especially for exams like this. So you have you have rights as technologists and employees as well. Um, now, again, we don't want to just be doing that, obviously, because we don't like scanning testicles, right? Um, you know, we're not going to fabricate those types of experiences and situations, and we're going to try our best to remain professional, um, even when the patient might be making a joke that's really not that funny or saying something that's really not that funny. We don't, you know, we, we want to have thick skin with, with something like this, but we also want to know what our boundaries are and what our limits are. Um, so that's kind of my little spiel about um, patient interaction with this type of exam. Now, as for uh, additional scanning tips, we want to make sure we are imaging the right and left testicle together so we can show the grayscale of both and the color Doppler of both. Also, if we see what's called a varicocele, which we're going to learn about, we want to be performing our Valsalva maneuver. So when we have that patient tight in their abdominal muscles and we can kind of see this abnormality popping in and out of view. We also want to make sure that if we're putting color on one of the testicles and it's not really giving us much of a signal, we want to make sure we're using our uh, color power Doppler to pick up any sensitive slow flow in that testicular tissue. We don't want to call a torsion a torsion if it isn't, because uh, then we're sending that patient to the OR for no reason. But we also don't want to make up blood flow if there truly isn't either. We don't want to miss a torsion. And then some indications for why we would be performing a scrotal exam, any type of pain, enlargement, palpable mass, uh, trauma, male infertility, and then any follow-up for previous orchiectomy. That is when they've had one of their testicles removed um, or if they've had a tumor previously. And then also if they have undescended testicles, this is known as cryptorchidism, which we're going to learn about that as well. We learn about that in OB again, um, but that's a pretty pretty serious condition. Babies are evaluated for that directly after uh, birth to make sure that the testicles descend into the scrotum. As we're developing in utero, those testicles sit in the pelvis and right before birth, they drop into the sac. If they don't drop and they stay up in the pelvis, that's when we have cryptorchidism and that can result in torsion, infertility, and cancer down the line for that patient. So tons of new information on this power point. Please make sure you understand all of this and we are going to move right into our uh, pathology PowerPoint.